Um, in this video, I'm going to provide a public response to a comment left by a channel called Seeking the One Saved on the uh, Repent of Your Sins documentary that I recently released concerning Isaiah 5920. So I recently released the documentary, uh, Repent of Your Sins, it's called, and it set out to, to show that the Bible, or at least the King James translation anyhow, it, it never verbatim says the phrase, repent of your sins to be saved. And the arguments were, in summary, that the exact word repent is never coupled with the word of sins. And obviously there, there are similar phrases, such as repent of this, thy wickedness, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, when we did have a, a whole section that when turning from sin is the context of repentance. It's addressed to God's people, believers. It's, it's not telling unsaved people, uh, unsaved sinners, how to, to, be, to be saved onto eternal life. So turning from sin is a biblical concept, which we, we did argue in the documentary. I did point that out. And it, it was addressed with, with a whole chapter, the whole chapter in the documentary to deal with that issue. But what, we, what I did was I, I decoupled it from salvation. Okay, so I'm, I'm saying that it's not a step to be saved onto eternal life. Now, uh, modern Bibles uh, rephrase certain verses and, and they substitute the, the word repent with other words. So uh, in context where sin is not applicable, such as God repenting, they'll, they'll substitute that word with a different word like God relented. And so the reader then starts to assume that repent always means to turn from sin. And uh, we, I also showed in the documentary that some translations, such as the New Living Translation, artificially injects the words of your sins. Uh, after repentance in, in several uh, key verses. And it's not just the NLT translation itself that does this. A lot of people, when they read the Bible, inject those words as well. So someone will take a statement like, uh, repent you and believe the gospel, and they'll, they'll read it as repent of your sins and, and believe the gospel. So there's this guy who, uh, his channel's called Seeking the One Saved, and he, he commented on the um, documentary, uh, citing Isaiah 59.20. Now, he didn't bother to actually provide the quote. He just, you know, he just said wh where to go for it. And, and this was his proof text that, that the entire documentary was wrong and I should therefore delete it. So just above his comment, I've shown you the, the King James rendering of, of the verse. So it says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. So, um, you know, perfectly consistent with my documentary. It doesn't say repent, it says turn, and it doesn't say of your sins, it says from transgression. Okay, so uh, he he's applying that, and, but that, I guess he's taking that to mean that it, it's a salvation verse. It's something that you have to do to, to be saved. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, in this video to, to refute what he's saying, basically. So let, let's just have a, look, a quick look at who this guy is. So the name of his channel might at first trick people within the free grace community because when when you see the words one saved you think of one saved always saved that's what you normally think of so when i first saw this guy you know i thought it was one of those kind of channels i thought oh this guy's probably going to be uh you know free grace and he, he does do uh several videos where he essentially contends for faith alone so he he's having a lot a lot a go at a lot of people that i would also have a go at like uh, keith at y city preachers and epuc on apologetics because they're sort of like front loading uh works onto the gospel if you like so he's ripping on them because you know as if as if he's advocating for um faith alone and sometimes he even includes clips by uh, free grace people like uh greg jackson and things and sometimes arguably as if he's taking their side in a particular issue but then uh, all you have to do is go on his about page and you see that he he does actually believe that christians lo can lose their salvation okay so it's kind of weird that he doesn't exactly fit in anywhere, really, because people, you see, people on, on the sort of free grace side, they'll look at all this faith alone. Oh, great, this guy believes in faith alone. Oh, but he believes in conditional security. So he's not really one of us. But then uh, people like uh, EPUC on apologetics and Y City Preachers, see, they all agree with him on conditional security, but they wouldn't have anything to do with him because it, it seems as if he gives a lot of lip service to... Um, faith alone so it's kind of we it's kind of a weird category that at first this guy sort of puts himself in but then uh, it, well in one of his videos he, he's sort of uh commenting on here um about the the whole uh faith and works issue let's see if i can find exactly what what he said um we overcome sin by continuing to believe if we proceed in faith we proceed in in works um and so on and so forth so it, it, he's trying to equate that you must have works if the faith is valid and so when you follow that to his logical conclusion you really explore what he believes 
he's purely arguing with like these guys over semantics because yeah they they do sometimes say that they believe in in works to be saved but if you actually listen to their arguments it's still really the same arguments that that this guy's proclaiming uh, well it is by faith but you know you will have the works if if it's really by faith and this comment i mean if he's arguing that we have to repent of our sins to be saved well he doesn't believe in faith alone then does he he believes in you have to have faith and you have to repent of, of your sins. Okay. So, um, his channel hasn't really been around for, uh, very long. Um, I mean, I'm currently doing this video in about August 2022. So he only really started, um, a year ago. So he's not much younger than my channel, really. But I, well, I recently overtook him in subscribers, probably fairly recently, despite the fact that he's got, um, far more content than I have. And a lot of his videos have got a lot more views than most of, um, my videos on my repentance stuff will have probably sort of boosted my subscriber count by now, but I would have expected that because he's got several hundred views on some of these videos, whereas I've only got a few dozen on mine, he would have more subscribers than that. But the thing is, he, he doesn't really fit in anywhere. So I, you know, who's going to subscribe to him because he doesn't belong in free grace, but he, he won't sandwich himself with these conditional security advocates either. So, you know, goodness knows what this guy's trying to pull. But, you know, he, he never shows his, his face and we, we don't know his name. So I'm always a little bit suspicious of people like that. I doesn't mean he's wrong, but uh, I'm just naturally suspicious of them. So that that's essentially who he is in, in a really uh, short nutshell. Okay. So he's he's quoting that verse essentially to say that the, the documentary was, was wrong and that I should just delete the whole documentary ba based on, on that. Now, there, there are a few things that I've overlooked and, uh, you know, I'll have to come clean about those in this video. But um, I'll just give you the full story as to what's going on. But just to clarify, just to make sure nobody's trying to manipulate me or misunderstand me deliberately, the documentary did not say that turning from sin is unbiblical or foreign to the Bible. There was a whole section on it, okay? What it, what it did assert is that turning from sin should be decoupled from salvation. So, and when I say turn from sin, I don't just mean recognising oneself as a sinner that needs saving, but, but actually turning from it to stop doing it, okay? I argued that turning from sin and stop doing that sin should not be coupled with salvation. That's what the documentary was saying, okay? So, uh, you know, works-based gospels, they couple it with salvation, i.e. repent of your sins to be saved. It's not just acknowledging that you're a sinner and that you need a saviour. You actually have to turn, walk in obedience, be willing to give up things, etc., etc. That's that's what that crowd essentially do. Now, Isaiah 59.20 was alluded to in the documentary. I just didn't actually provide the quote for it, okay? I didn't do any work on it. I didn't do any interpretation of it. So at the point about uh, an hour and 47 uh, minutes in, sorry, I seem to have lost my mouse here for a second. So about an hour and 47 minutes in and, and a half. Uh, this is where I was going through some of the, the Protestant reformers who were using this terminology or very similar terminology where repentance is being equated with of, of their sin. And so I provided a quote from uh, John Calvin, which I found in this uh, book. You can see there, Institute for Christian Religion, Volume 3. And this is John Calvin's quote. So Calvin said, A Redeemer will come to Zion and to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. And so what I said in the documentary was that he's paraphrasing Isaiah 59, 20. Uh, this is not a direct quote because as you saw from the previous screen, well, the King James anyway says turn from transgression doesn't say repent of their sins. Okay. Similar wording, but it's not the same words though. So that that's a paraphrase. It's not a direct quote. Now I'm not sure like, you know, as the, as we know today, Bible translation, I'm not sure what Calvin would have used, but as far as I understand, uh, he did understand Hebrew and Greek, I think. So he could have gone to original source. It is possible. Maybe he read, a Bible that perhaps reads a bit more like that, but uh, that's not really, any, you know, that's not an entirely accurate quote because it says tran uh, transgression and it says turn. So that's how a lot of Bibles will translate that verse. Okay, now I think some French Bibles might be a bit different, and I know he was French, but uh, I don't really know enough about that to comment, to be honest. Maybe that maybe that specific point wasn't as um, researched as, as I could have done, uh, just because that I wasn't really focusing a lot on that bit really. But I was just showing that how that that catchphrase is sort of creeping its way in here and there. But it, it, said, it said basically the claim is that that's that's a paraphrase that that's not actually what what the verse says exactly. Okay. Now there is a small confession I have to make. Um, I, I did actually overlook 
covering Isaiah 59.20 directly or strongly, um, be, j- just for several reasons. First of all, um, I, I did not claim in the documentary that the Bible never says to turn from sins or that it's a completely unbiblical concept. What it did claim is that the specific word repent is never coupled with the specific word uh, sin or, or of sin rather, which in, in the King James Bible that that is true. Um, I, I made a distinction between repentance for salvation, so turn to God, believe, and repenting of sins, quote unquote, for somebody who is already a believer. That was that was the point of the documentary. Um, I didn't cover most of the turn verses because I was dealing primarily with repentance, as is translated in the in the King James Bible. So. You know, we, we usually accept that turning is a general word. We, we can turn from all kinds of things. You can turn from this, you can turn from that. Sometimes sin is the context of turning, but not always. And we all accept that. But it, it's the fact that re- when people see the word repentance, they automatically assume it's of your sin. They, they won't acknowledge that repentance can mean other things to turn from, just like the word turn. Okay. Um, I did think that dedicating an enchi- entire chapter in the documentary to turning from sin as the context of re- repentance would provide enough clarity on my position about those verses, but apparently not, hence his comment. Um, now, uh, this, this one I wasn't aware of. I, I was not aware that the um, New International Version does actually translate Isaiah 59.20 as repent of their sins and, and i didn't realize that uh, making the documentary so I'll, I'll i'll give you the reasons why that is so if you look at isaiah fifty nine twenty on uh, on bible hub obviously this gives you a bunch of different translations and you'll see that most of what we tend to regard as the the accurate translations so like king james the esv the the nasb and so on they pr- they, they mostly most of them anyway say turn from transgression that that's how they translate the you know it's the hebrew word for turn and it's the uh hebrew word for for transgression and, and that's in the singular uh form as well you, you can go down and see that it's in the um oh, sorry it's not scrolling here uh, you can go down and, and see that it's in the uh si- singular form if you if you find that down there in the concordance now um in, in the niv that's where it, it translates it as uh repent of, of their sins and that's actually that's a minority translation. That that's not how other Bibles uh, translate it. Now, um, before the King James onlyists throw their hands up, you know, in, in outrage because the NIV has translated "turn" as "repent," uh, just be aware that the King James Bible does sometimes translate the Hebrew word for "turn" as "repent" in some some verses, and I, I can tell you why that that is in a moment. But uh, I, I didn't realise that the NIV translates this verse in that way. Now, now, I'll show you why I missed it, okay? So, for people who, who read the King James Bible, we've got this brilliant tool here, and on the thekingsbible.com, there's, there's a concordance section, okay? And I can essentially search for any word in here, and, and, it, and it will it will search in the concordance by the English word, not the Hebrew or Greek word, right? So, if I type in... Uh, oh, if I can spell it correctly, I can uh, type in repent. There we go. I can do a search and it will just show me all the verses that, that say repent. Now, I would have to um, search for uh, repented or repenteth or, or whatever it is, you know, separately. But it, it would give me all the verses that say repent in, in the English King James Bible, irrespective of what the underlying Hebrew or Greek is. So in this column, this tells me what the underlying Hebrew reference is. So I know that in these two verses, for, for instance, that Hebrew word there is not the same as that Hebrew word there. So if you were searching in a concordance by the Hebrew word, you wouldn't get both of these results. You'd get one or the other. Whereas in English, you know, it's given me the, the search for any Hebrew or Greek, what, whatever the underlying word is, if it's translated as repent in the King James Bible, it, it will give me that, that verse. So it, it's really easy to search by the King James to look for verses that have the appropriate key word in it. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, just like the NIV does in uh, Isaiah 4, uh, 59 20, the King James does occasionally translate the Hebrew word for turn as repent instead. I think it's turn or, or return. Um, but you can understand when you translate it into English, it does make sense why they've done that. Because if it said return and turn or, or turn and turn, it, it would kind of read a bit silly in English. So uh, it tends to use the word repent when it's kind of a standalone word but then it'll translate turn, uh, you know, when, when there is some context to the word. So the King James does it as well. It's not not just the NIV 
that, that's doing it there. So you can't entirely say that the NIV um, is, is wrong to use the word um, repent. But here's the problem when you, you try and use, when you don't use the King James or you just want any Bible translation, it becomes a lot harder to search what you're looking for. So if I go on Bible Hub and type in repent, it gives me a few suggestion words, uh, verses, sorry, but it, it doesn't actually list all of them. And, and really, it's giving me a few uh, articles about the Hebrew word, but it, it's not listing all of the verses in a concordance, and it, it won't give me all of the verses across all translations where they happen to use the English word repent. And, and the search is really more to do with the Hebrew than it is to do with the um, English. As I just said, uh, the King James has got a really good concordance, so I can go on a search engine, type in KJV concordance, and the chances are this website is going to be the first thing that comes up. So straight there, search a word, find the verse. It's, it's as easy as that. I find that when you're trying to search for an NIV online concordance or an ESV online concordance or just any other translation, there's almost nothing because a lot of these concordances, they're not really a concordance in the same way that this is a concordance. You can't just type in a word and get all the verses that you want. And a lot of the time it's just book sales. Like it's trying to sell me a book that I can buy on Amazon. Well, I don't want a book that I can buy. I just want an online concordance where I can search a word and you will show me in your Bible every verse where you've translated that word. Maybe other people know that something that I don't. I just, I always find it really difficult to search in non-King James Bibles for that same facility. I don't know why. So that's another reason why I kind of end up missing the fact that the NIV translates it differently. Now, one of them, I think this Bible Study Tools does have an NIV concordance, but um, first of all, going there straight from a search engine doesn't take me to what I need for a start, so, you know, I'm already lost on this website already. Eventually, when I do find the page, I, I didn't even realise it had a concordance, because when I search for the word there and find it, I get all of this big, long explanation that I didn't ask for, and I have to scroll all the way down for the... Um, Concordance. And so there is the uh, Isaiah 59, uh, 20, where it, you know, it shows that the NIV has translated this as repent there. And so they're, they're kind of the reasons why I missed it, and I wasn't aware that the NIV uh, translates it that way. So obviously, if you're reading an NIV Bible and you saw the doc documentary, well, you're going to open Isaiah 59, 20 and think, well, it does say repent of sins. I mean, there it is. This, this guy's you know talking complete little rubbish, uh, you know, if, if you happen to use the um, NIV. Um, but uh, it's, I, I, it's not just the fact that it says repent of, of, of sins, though. It's um, because the, the guy who commented, Seeking the One Saved, he's making it a um, salvation verse, essentially. But let, let's take a look here. What's the controversy? Well, the document, the documentary decoupled, turning from sin as a salvation requirement, asserted that to be saved, the requirement is to believe on him, not turn over a new... Uh, sorry, I meant to put leaf, not life there, and, you know, starting to fix one's life. So uh, he's essentially using this verse to um, argue that it, it is actually a, a salvation uh, requirement. He says, a redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. OK, now my reply to this, not realising that the NIV translates it differently, is that in a word count, it doesn't say repent of your sins. And I, I didn't go on to say, but it doesn't even say to be saved. OK. Um, you know, he's making it a salvation verse when I wouldn't necessarily. But my argument was that um, those who turn from transgression, according to Isaiah 59, 20, are God's own people because it, it said people in Jacob. OK, God's people. So I'm making the, the assertion there that God's people are the ones who need to turn from their sins, not the unsaved um, publicans and harlots. OK. Now, in his reply, I think he misunderstood. When I said God's people, I think he seemed to misunderstand that for sort of fleshly Jews or, you know, Jews by the bloodline, that you are saying that Jews need to repent of their sins to be saved, right? Well, no. And so I clarified my position on that. Jews need to repent of rejecting Jesus. They need to repent of their false religion of Judaism. Putting down the alcohol and, you know, not calling their leaders rabbi anymore, that's not going to get them saved, okay? So I really clarified what the documentary already points out, is that turning from sin is a command to God's people, not the, the unsaved person, he needs to repent of his unbelief. He needs to repent from what he's trusting in. And I gave uh, a verse to show that, you know, the, the chastisement of the Lord and so on and so on. And so uh, he says, then, that makes no sense. You are saying that the Jews can fail to turn from transgression and still be saved. That's not what Isaiah 59, 20 says. Now he goes on to quote it and uh, notice how he quotes it here. So he says, it says, the Saviour comes to them 
that turns from their transgressions. And so he says it's a very poor documentary, etc., uh, etc., et that, you know, I'm wrong, I'm making stuff up with a very high word count, apparently. Um, of course, you know, they, never mind the fact that the documentary had dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of Bible verses. He's got one, so then, you know, he wins the debate, apparently. That's, that's, that's how it works, but there you go. And so, uh, in my next reply, um, I, you know, I basically, well, in a nutshell, I said that the Bible's full of examples where it told people to believe on him. John's gospel is deliberately written to tell people out of eternal life, and it doesn't tell them to turn from their sins. So it's not a very good book if it doesn't mention that step that he says is essential. And so I accuse them of essentially blaspheming Jesus by accusing Jesus of preaching a false gospel to all of those different people. And I pointed out that when Jesus said, go and sin no more, he didn't mention eternal life or believing on him, so it's not the context of that statement. Now, uh, I didn't get a, re a further reply, which, you know, I don't blame him for that. I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't command us to just debate people to death and quarrel and argue with people. So, you know, I I'm not... I'm not sort of calling him out for not replying to that, but I don't really know how you can reply to that, to be honest. But I, d I didn't hear back from him after that point. But I thought, well, in none of my replies, I've not really given a breakdown of Isaiah 59, 20, and, you know, why I assert that it's referring to God's people exactly. So I thought I'd kind of do this video to to sort of go go through it. Okay. Now, I want to show you something that he's doing here. This is the elephant in the room. I mentioned just a few slides ago that the documentary showed that, that people read the Bible and they artificially inject their own words into it. So the Bible says, repent and believe the gospel, and they read, repent of your sins and believe the gospel, or turn from your sins and believe the gospel. But those two think that's not what that verse says. The verse says, repent and believe the gospel. That's what it says. And so he's doing something very similar here. So let me show you his uh, comment again. So he says, it says, so Isaiah 59, 20 says, the saviour comes to them that turn from their transgressions so first of all it, it doesn't say the savior it says the redeemer seeking the one saved that's what it actually says it doesn't say savior okay and in fact all major translations that i know of say redeemer because that's what it says okay it says transgression in the singular not the plural okay now the the niv as we when we looked at it in the niv the niv makes it plural okay the nlt makes it plural now Someone could probably find me a verse somewhere in the Bible where the King James quotes, you know, makes a verse plural and other Bibles make it singular based on the underlying Hebrew or Greek. I don't speak Hebrew or Greek. I can't comment on what's a more accurate translation. But seeing as the Bibles that we regard as the most accurate translations, such as the King James or the ESV or etc., they say transgression singular. OK, so I'm just going to assume that the expert committee of Bible translators in the King James Bible know how to translate that word and remember that the niv is not as formally equivalent as other translations there are parts where they deliberately rephrase it to quote unquote make it easier for the people for their uh, readers so it's not sins it's transgression uh, okay no plural and that's what it says see he's quoting it as the plural but it's not in the plural it says transgression singular okay next thing to draw your attention to is see where it says uh, the not the savior but the redeemer comes to them that turn from their transgression see he's equating that with salvation well see the savior comes to them who turn from their transgression if you haven't turned from your transgression the savior is not going to come to you and you're not going to get saved so uh you know we need to break down what what that actually means the savior comes to them and is that even equivalent to salvation is that even what that means okay and so you know essentially he's misquoting the verse now we've all been guilty of this i've had to apologize on my channel various times for, for misquoting a few verses here and there and, and sometimes it was actually very embarrassing because i once quoted um john 10 uh, my, my sheep hear and obey my voice well it doesn't say and obey and i was trying to refute somebody who was always trying to put works in the gospel so you know we've all been guilty of that but but he is misquoting it it doesn't say the savior comes to them that turn from their transgressions it says the redeemer shall come on to zion and onto them that turn from transgression okay so you know it's very important that you quote it correctly if you're going to argue a strong case for something so let's have a quick look through Isaiah to see what what's really uh, going on okay so the first thing to as, as I've just mentioned is that he misquotes the first it doesn't say savior it says redeemer okay now a savior is one who saves a redeemer is one who redeems the difference is, is that to be saved is to be rescued or preserved from an undesirable outcome i.e saved from the condemnation of hell onto eternal life Redeeming, though, is a different word, and it actually means to claim back what is either rightfully yours or was originally yours to begin with, such as to 
buy back or win back, or it can also mean to change for the better or return or make amends for. Now, if I'm arguing that uh, the context is God's own people, well, that makes perfect sense. God is just getting back what's already his to begin with. Okay. Now, the problem that you have with um, prophecy books like Isaiah is that sometimes there's not really a lot of context as to who he was preaching to, where he was preaching, how he preached, you know, was it in a pulpit, was it in the street, whatever it was, um, and what was when would the subject or the situation change. So we have a lot of prophecies in Isaiah. We don't always have a lot of background as to what exactly he was addressing. Okay. So sometimes, you know, is it is it targeting God's people spiritually? Is it talking, targeting the nation of Israel physically? Or, you know, is it trying to address both points of view? Is it pointing to Jesus' first coming? Or is it pointing to his second coming? Or, you know, is it not pointing to neither of those events? We, we don't always know. Okay, so rather than just quote mining 5920 as if that dismantles a documentary containing dozens and dozens and dozens of verses, we're going to just look at the chapter before, the chapter in, and the chapter afterwards to get some context. Okay, so starting in uh, 58.1, who is Isaiah addressing? Well, he says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression. So I'm just going to highlight that for our dear friend uh, seeking the one saved, okay? Because that's kind of my position. When the Bible says to turn from transgression, it's addressed to God's own people, okay? It's not telling unsaved publican and all how to be saved, okay? So that's the context who he's addressing right here, all right? Now, this this isn't all negative, folks. Now, uh, when you read that there, that's negative, okay? There's, there's sin amongst my people. That's a negative. But then, look here, we, we kind of have a positive here. Now, he's saying it kind of as a criticism, but it, it's positive in itself. They seek me daily. So, so despite the fact that my people, they, they have their sins, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness, and, and so on and so on. And so he actually starts to use positive language about them. And that's a bit like when you read Jesus' letters to Revelation, the churches in Revelation. It wasn't always negative. He told them the things that they were doing right, and he told them the things that they were doing wrong, okay? Both of them, okay? It's not all negative, all right? The next few verses, um, it's kind of about the, the people there doing a fast, and it's not really the specific type of the fast that the Lord would like don't really think you can make any uh, salvation points out of that to be honest so um but then you'll notice that uh, once we get to verse 9 we have more of this positive language you shall call and the lord shall answer you shall cry and he shall say here i am uh, and so on and so on and we've got we've got more positive language uh, you've got the lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul so we've, we've got a lot of good things here it's not you know it's not all negative about all these wicked sins of these terrible wicked unsaved sinners okay there's there's bits of positive there's bits of negative okay and that uh, that carries on for uh, a few more verses okay so that's uh, that's kind of you know setting the premise of uh, chapter 59 chapter 58 is addressing god's own people and we've got some positives as well as negatives okay now in verse 1 it says behold the land uh, that the lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save okay now um you know someone will take that we'll see you know cannot save you know this is about eternal life but, but the thing is though folks there are other things he can be saved from okay and there are examples in the Old Testament of how God judged his people by taking them out of their land and sending a drought and all this kind of stuff. And so that save can literally apply to anything, okay? Eternal hellfire is not being spoken about here. Great condemnation is not being spoken about here. So there's no eternal damnation context behind the word save there, okay? You see, the false prophets, they love vague scripture like this where it's not always clear what the salvation is you know because he believes in conditional security right you know it's like how they always quote he who endures to the end shall be saved well see right there you know to be saved onto eternal life you need to endure to the end yeah go back and read the verse it has nothing to do with eternal life because it's talking about end time stuff and tribulation it's not talking about eternal life but you know it, they just they just quote mine all the time with absolutely no context whatsoever now, um, you know, in the last chapter, we saw some positive language. Now we're starting to see some uh, negative language. So, uh, you know, your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you. Now, they, again, they often make that as like a hellfire thing because it's separated between you and your God. And that's that is this misunderstanding that hell is eternal separation from God. OK, now let me tell you, those atheists like Christopher Hitchens and 
Richard Dawkins, they love to be eternally separated from God, okay? Problem is, is that the Bible actually says that hell is in the presence of the Lamb, in the presence of his holy angels. So, no, hell is not separation from God, in that manner of speaking. It's the very opposite of that, okay? People in hell wish they were separated from God. So we've we've got more uh, negative language here. Uh, you know, this is this is negative stuff now. Uh, none calls for justice, none pleads the truth. They all trust in vanity, they speak lies, conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. So there's a few things going on here. Um, but this justice thing is something that, that's going to keep uh, cropping up um, in, as, as we progress through this chapter. Now, this bit here in verse five, they hatch a cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's webs. He that eats the, their eggs dies and that which is crushed breaks out into a viper. Now, this is quite a poetic statement isn't it it's not really very clear what that means it's kind of uh, a metaphor if you like you know not not really very clear on what that means it's quite poetic and again false prophets love verses like that because anything that's poetic they can use it however they want okay so again our dear friend seeking the one saved believes in conditional security well what's one of the key passages that they like to go to john 15 about the, the branches being cutting off if they don't abide Funnily enough, that, that passage doesn't mention eternal life directly. You, you show them John 6 and John 10, which does mention eternal life, that Jesus will lose nothing and none shall be plucked out of my hand. They reject that because of John 15, which doesn't mention eternal life. And it's quite poetic. You know, is it, we're not literal wooden branches attached to a big wooden tree that's Christ. You know, it's quite, um, anal you know, a bit of an analogy there. But they love that stuff because it's so easy for them to abuse it and then throw away all the clear scripture that's not being poetic at all. When Jesus says, I give them unto eternal life, no man shall ever pluck them out of my hand. I should lose nothing. He ain't being poetic, folks. Okay, you know, not really any other way you can interpret that statement. So in uh, the next verses, we start. he starts to list everything that's um, going wrong. Uh, they they won't cover themselves with their works because their works are, are works of um, iniquity. Uh, so, you know, a bit of background. So, you know, there is a lot of sin going on. There is a lot of uh, wickedness, but we're not really dealing with a saved person versus an unsaved person. This is God's own nation that's that's gone astray, essentially. And so... Um, it, it start, it, here's this justice theme reoccurring again. There's the just, justice, sorry, judgment far from us. Neither does justice overtake. So all this wicked stuff is happening in the land and the justice system is not doing anything about it. Okay. It's not punishing evildoers. Okay. And this is quite a, a key theme that, that's going, that, that's going wrong here. Okay. And so because they won't punish this uh, iniquity, because they won't, you know, punish these transgressions, transgressions are just being multiplied and, that, and that's essentially uh, what, what's happening there okay and then you start to get to uh, verse 15 and notice yea truth fails and he that departs from evil makes himself a prey okay so this is not saying something good about the person who departs from evil this is something negative okay what does it mean he becomes a prey well someone who is prey if there's prey there's a predator okay and that makes perfect sense because if there's all this iniquity and it's not being punished the justice system is not doing it then he that departs from evil he's prey to all the wicked people because he has departed from evil but the justice system is not punishing the people that are against him okay now this is quite key here so the lord sees this as it says there the lord saw it and it displeased the lord that there was no justice okay he saw that there was no man he wondered that there was no intercessor, okay? So it says then that his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness it sustained him. Well, who's him? Uh, we presume it means that this man who um, who has fallen prey to uh, this judgment that, that's gone wrong, okay? That's, that's what's going on here. And so then it goes on to say, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate, the helmet of salvation. Uh, now, we're all quite familiar with this because um, Paul quotes this in uh is it ephesians i've got it in my notes here somewhere uh, ephesians 6 paul, paul quotes this okay this you know breastplate of righteousness the helmet of salvation and so on and so forth when paul quoted that he's writing to the ephesian church to the saints okay that the, the church is at ephesus that's who he's writing to he's writing to his fellow brethren he's not writing a letter to the pagans to tell them hey they better you know do this stuff you know put on the helmet of salvation or they're not going to be saved this is stuff that paul addresses to saved christians people who are already believers okay and 
Well, we so far see that this passage is addressed to God's people. It's not addressed to the foreign nations and the heathen. It's addressed to God's own people, right? Now, when Paul uh, mentions this in Ephesians 6, um, he's giving the, it as an encouragement, and he says uh, to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. So Paul is using this as an encouragement, not as an instruction how to be saved, but as an encouragement because of the fact to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Okay, now... In a way, Isaiah is pretty much saying this in a very similar way here, because we've got this guy who has departed from evil. He's made himself pray because there's all this wickedness and it's not being punished. So, you know, they can just abuse this guy. But the Lord has seen that. And so what this is, this is a comfort to this righteous person who has departed from iniquity, but he's being taken advantage of by other people. OK, that's that's an encouragement to that kind of a person. It's not instructions to tell unsaved Joe out there how to be saved, okay? No mention of eternal life here, you know, or anything like that. And uh, according to their deeds, he will repay, and, and, you know, there's another one, they want to make it about works in heaven versus, you know, the, the works that send you to hell. But we're only dealing with God's people here. We haven't got a paradigm of dealing with the the pagans and you know all, all the people outside of god's nation we just haven't got that in this passage okay now watch how verse 19 kind of completes verse 18 so in verse 18 according to their deeds he will repay and recompense uh, to his enemies okay so i'm just going to highlight that there for a second so it says so why is the lord going to do all this what's the point of all this that he said in these previous verses okay well so th so shall they fear the name of the lord from the west okay now I don't know sort of what geography he was targeting there, but Israel is obviously in the west of, of the Middle East there, you know, because it's got some sea to the west. So a lot of nations would, would perhaps be east, I guess. I don't know that for sure. Uh, and his glory from the rising of the sun. And, and watch this. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up his standard against him. And so that lifting up a standard like a banner, that's like warfare language right there. Okay, so the enemy... Is going to come into this nation, is going to come towards Israel or come towards the house of Jacob, and the Spirit of the Lord will resist the enemy. So he's actually arguably taking the side of Jacob in that verse. Okay, again, context is everything, folks. So if you turn from your iniquity, well, it's not that you're going to be saved onto eternal life, but when your enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord shall push back against the enemy. Okay, that's what's really going on there. And so then we have this verse that, that uh, he was pointing out, that the uh, Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. So we're still in Jacob, the house of Jacob. God's people is being addressed here. Not unsaved publican and harlot, you know, that's, that's outside, okay? This is the people inside that God is dealing with, okay? He's judging his own people, all right? Now then, the last verse in this chapter. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. Now, Issues with the covenant, I've not really done a lot of um, personal study on, on covenant agreements uh, in the Bible. So I, I don't want, at the risk of making claims that aren't true, um, I, I don't want to say something that might be false. But somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but normally when God makes a covenant, like covenant with Moses or the covenant with, uh, you know, Abraham or the covenant with, you know, the nation of Israel... His covenants are typically agreed, uh, you know, targeted towards his own people, aren't they? He, he doesn't, I'm, I'm not aware, if somebody is aware of where God makes covenants with his enemies and the people outside of Israel and, you know, the pagans and the heathen, please pop it in the chat because, uh, you know, then I can do some, speed up my homework a little bit. But, you know, I'm not aware that God goes around making covenants with a bunch of people that aren't saved okay now saved people uh, unsaved people the only covenant they need to worry of he that believeth on him hath everlasting life and he that believeth not is not condemned but again the covenant effect covenant agreements only apply if you then believe and get saved okay so again covenant targeting god's own people that's the target audience not unsaved joe who needs to hear the gospel okay now then, we start to get into uh, Arise, in the next chapter, so chapter 60. Uh, I'll, I'll be fairly quick with this, but Arise, shine, the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is, is risen upon you. Okay, so we've uh, you know, got a lot of things pointing to Jesus here. Now, uh, the next few verses um, are somewhat uh, poetic. Okay, so you know we, we can't really make a lot of doctrine out of this in regards to eternal life, really. Um but if you start to look through chapter 60, which comes immediately out, because remember the chapter numbers weren't there in the original. So here, you know, we're only a few verses after 
Isaiah 59, 20, okay? We just keep on reading. And you'll start to notice that a lot of the stuff in this chapter is very end time stuff, okay? Stuff that doesn't really apply to his first coming. A lot of this is second coming type stuff that he's talking about here, okay? In fact, just to give you some cases in point, for the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly wasted, okay? Well, I don't know about most Christians. I'm not feeling that one yet, folks. I think it's a little bit too early to say that that's being fulfilled. Now, when you start to study end times, it makes perfect sense when that's going to be fulfilled, okay? When Jesus is ruling and reigning on the earth and so on and so forth, okay? So, and we've also got this, the city of the Lord, the Zion, the Holy One of Israel, this city. And what do we read in Revelation? We read, you know, about the, the new heaven and the new earth and, and so on, and, you know, the glorious city towards the end of Revelation. Okay. And here's another one. You shall suck the milk of the Gentiles and shall suck the breast of kings. Well, I wonder if uh, Seeking the One Save thinks he's sucking the breast of kings for salvation. Okay. You know, th this stuff, this isn't salvation language here, folks. You know, a lot of this is to do with a lot of end time stuff. Okay. And this is really, th th I mean, this kind of solidifies the whole end times thing. You get to verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, wasting within your borders. Well, that clearly didn't happen when Jesus came the first time, because if you look at history after Jesus departed, there was all kinds of violence in Jerusalem and, you know, the Jews getting kicked out and all kinds of things, okay? Here's another key one. The sun shall be no more your light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto you, but the Lord shall be an everlasting light. And if you get, if you study Revelation... This is end time stuff that we're talking about here, okay? First of all, when the Lord even comes the second time, it's, you know, the sun and the moon were darkened, okay? And, you know, everything that happens then. And then, in, you know, in the new city, it's the glory of the Lord that lights up that city, okay? So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to study this in more great detail than I have done, but, you know, we're, ju we're just skimming through the surrounding context around Isaiah 59, 20, instead of just quoting it and being all big-headed like we're right about everything, Okay. So thus far then, folks, if we just look at what we've seen in the verses so far, the target audience is God's own people. It's not telling publicans and harlots how to be saved, okay? Now, you, you could interpret this as being the physical nation of Israel if you want to, which, if that's the case, then it's not a salvation verse, okay? You could interpret it as referring to God's own people, which the documentary already argued the case for, that turning from sin is a directive to God's own people, okay? Not for salvation. You could interpret it as uh, being the bloodline Jews, which, you know, some perhaps is, is perhaps how he was interpreting my, my comment. We'll look at that in a moment. But the goal was intended to redeem people that were already regular worshippers in a previously obedient nation. We saw that sort of, you know, earlier in 58. Some issues had deteriorated. So we had positive themes, we had negative themes. And the later context, when you start getting to chapter 50, suggests that it's end times related and related to the second coming of Jesus, not his first coming, which will tie in with, you know, if, if you want to tie that in with bloodline Jews rather than God's own people. Okay. And so he, he misunderstood me when I said God's people. He, he's perhaps thinking about bloodline Jews there, you know, the, the physical Israel, not, not the, um, spiritual Israel. Okay. Now, the, the thing is the, there was kind of a, what I would call the Jewish juxtaposition, if you like, in, in terms of how Jesus addressed the Jews in the Gospels. Because what, what, what the documentary argued, repentance of salvation, turn away from idols, unbelief, etc. to God, believe on Christ. Repentance of the believer, so not, not salvation, turn from your wickedness, whatever happens, uh, that, that happens to be. So Jesus did talk about those above two things interchangeably with Jews and Pharisees in various conversations. So some conversations he would talk with the Jews and he's saying, hey, you guys need to believe on me for everlasting life. Other conversations, he would, you know, say that, you know, you need to turn from wickedness or, you know, this, this, what he said about adultery and this, what he said about that subject uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so he did tell Jewish audiences to do both of those camps of things. Okay, in a way, many Jews weren't saved and so Jesus needed to get them saved. So being a redeemer, he needed to redeem his people back and get them saved but you know we know a lot of people, Jewish people didn't believe on him but also nominally speaking the Jewish people were God's people nominally okay so you know salvation is of the Jews so in principle they should have been saved believers because salvation is of the Jews 
but obviously many of them weren't. So Jesus spoke to Jews with both perspectives in mind. And this is sort of like um, when I've uh, gone, out, gone out soul winning with my uh, friend James, he usually does most of the talking because he's, he's just better at it than me. But often when we're dealing with Christians... He, he will still deal with the eternal life stuff if, you know, if he's a little bit doubtful about those Christian salvation, you know, it's by believing, it's free gift, etc, etc. Just like we would do with the atheist or the Hindu or anybody else. But then when he's dealing with Christians, he often does scratch at some of the sins as well. Like, hey, what's that, you know, you're a Christian, what's that Buddha doing in the window? Hey, you know, what's with that idol up there or whatever it might be? And it, you know, it could be any number of things. So he does deal with some sins of Christians because yes that person might not be saved so they need to understand the gospel but calling themselves a Christian in principle they should be God's people and so we will hold them to a higher standard than we will the person that doesn't claim to be a Christian we, we speak to them from the perspective of both audiences okay and that's really essentially what Jesus is doing with the Jews here now, if you look through John's Gospel, eternal life is a common theme throughout the book. It was deliberately written with eternal life in mind, and eternal life is frequently coupled with believing on him. Okay? The passage is about sin no more and obey my commandments. They're never directly coupled with eternal life. Now, there's a few verses people read to make them about eternal life. It's never directly coupled with eternal life, though. Okay? Believing on him is. Uh, many of Jesus' conversations in John's Gospel were probably first-time encounters, or at least... Jesus had to re-solidify faith to people who weren't grasping some basic teaching, whereas a lot of his preaching against sin in other Gospels was directed to people who were already listeners and were already aware of him to some degree. And that's, that, I mean, that's a gross overgeneralization, but that, that is often what happened. Okay. Just to summarize really, really quickly, you know, in John's Gospel, Nicodemus already had an idea about Jesus, but it's not evident that they ever met. Okay. So Jesus was much more gr graceful with Nicodemus than other Pharisees. The woman at the well in the next chapter, never met him before. Uh, the Jews who questioned the layman probably didn't know who Jesus was until after the healing. Um, we again don't know that for sure. But um, Jews in chapter six came to Jesus for the wrong reasons. They came to eat bread. Okay, so he had to bring it back to basics. Essentially, you no, know, it's about believing on him because they they were coming to him for the wrong reasons. Jews in chapter seven were disputing whether or not he was actually the Christ. Okay, so you know some of them probably knew about him. Some of them didn't. Uh, the man who healed uh, was healed of his blindness in John nine. Never met Jesus before, and again, Jews were divided about the Christ. And Jesus solidified the faith of Mary and Martha by raising Lazarus from the dead. So that's what happened in John's Gospel. And over and over again, it's believed being equated with eternal life. Now, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, the centurion approached Jesus, but probably hadn't met Jesus before. His faith was commended. Okay, not his works, his faith. The man healed of the palsy in Matthew chapter 9 was told, your sins be forgiven after Jesus seeing their faith, not their turning from sins, it's after Jesus seeing their faith, said, your sins be forgiven. Okay, so this is the gospel, repentance of salvation, believing on him. That's what Jesus is drilling to all of these different people, all right? Now, when Jesus did preach against sin and the sin was the issue, well, he, he he told that to the woman at the well and the lame man in Bethesda to sin no more in John's gospel. Never mentioned believing on him, never mentioned eternal life. It's not the context of that statement, sin no more. Otherwise, he should have coupled it with eternal life and he didn't. OK, now in the synoptic gospels where Jesus dealt with sin, well, in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus preached against sin, multitudes came to listen to him, including his own disciples. OK. That's the target audience for his teaching, not unsaved publican and harlot out there. It's his disciples and the multitudes that came to listen to his teaching. They were the target audience for the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus preached on all kinds of things in that chapter and a wide variety of subjects. OK, uh, Jesus rebuked various cities in Matthew 11 for not repenting. So it's not that while well, the cities didn't know who Jesus was and he needed to tell them how to repent, they had already rejected John and rejected Jesus after seeing miracles. So Jesus did all those miracles. They still rejected him. OK, so now we move on to ripping on the, those cities. OK, it's not dealing with a first time visitor telling them how to be saved. The Pharisees in Matthew 12 saw his miracles and still accused him of casting out devils by the power of Satan. And yet the, the Pharisees later in that same chapter are still seeking a sign. So, of course, Jesus is going to rip on them for their sins and all kinds of things because they already knew who he was. OK, again, not telling unsaved publican and all that who doesn't know Jesus how to be saved. It's rebuking a lot of people that have seen his miracles and still reject him anyway. OK. 
Once we get to the Pharisees in Matthew 15, they were teaching doctrines of men, already knew about Jesus' disciples because they're asking him about them not washing their hands. Well, they must have known that they don't do that, so they must have had some idea who they were and must have seen them before, okay? So we're, again, not dealing with first-time visitors. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew 16, they came to Jesus purely to tempt him. They weren't interested in eternal life. They just wanted to tempt him, okay? And really, you know, I could go on and on with other examples when Jesus preached in Matthew 18 against sin. The teaching was directed at his disciples, okay? The Pharisees came again to Jesus in Matthew 9 to tempt him, not because they were inquiring about salvation. Now, the rich young ruler, he's an unusual case because he was given works to inherit eternal life, but even after Jesus said, there is none good but God, still claimed to have obeyed them all since his youth, okay? The lawyer in Luke 10, also, he was given works to inherit eternal life, not faith. But he came to Jesus to tempt him, not because he genuinely wanted an answer. Okay, when Jesus cleansed the temple, the temple should have already been a clean space to begin with. So, you know, it's got nothing to do with telling unsaved people how to be saved. This is cleaning up the house of God. Okay. And then when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, this is already at the judgment. It's too late for people to be saved anyway. So it's not really a very good chapter to tell people how to be saved, is it? So you start to see a pattern here, okay, when people were genuinely interested in seeking eternal life, or when people were unfamiliar with Jesus, he told them, believe, have eternal life, okay? Now when Jesus preached to his disciples, or the multitudes, then he would say, you know, do this, don't do that, turn from sin. Because why? Because it's directed, in, in principle at least, to God's own people, okay? Doesn't matter if unsaved publican and harlot, you know, does all the things that Jesus warned about, because he's already unsaved anyway. Makes no difference to his salvation whether he does or doesn't do them, okay? It, it's directed to his disciples. When Pharisees and Jews saw his works and still rejected him anyway, and when they purely tried to tempt him, having no interest in seeing any reason at all, and they taught doctrines not found in the Bible, then Jesus said, woe unto you. Okay, he didn't say, woe unto you, because you say you want to be saved and you won't repent of all your sins. That's not what happened, folks. Okay. And so, you know, if you want to insist that turning from sin is an essential component of the gospel, you have to accuse Jesus and the apostles of preaching a false gospel or an incomplete gospel to multiple people multiple times and that's what my last comment said to seeking the one saved he has to accuse jesus of preaching a false gospel for telling all those people to believe on him without telling them hey you need to turn from your transgression as well while you're at it okay you know or if he did tell them well it's not documented and the bible ought to tell us if john's gospel is written to tell us how to have eternal life and he keeps missing that crucial step out okay isaiah fifty nine twenty is never quoted as a go-to verse to preach the gospel to anybody in the new testament Jesus or the apostles could have quoted it when talking about eternal life. It was really that important, but they didn't. They did quote plenty of verses about believing. Lord, who has believed our report? You know, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him to righteousness. We have plenty of verses like that in the New Testament. We don't have Isaiah 59, 20 being quoted to tell people how to be saved, though, do we? And uh, if, you, if you take it to mean the Jewish people, as I'd address the Jewish bloodline, well, you know, let, let's say, OK, they need to turn from transgression for the Redeemer to come to them. Well, if you look at the pattern of the Jewish people throughout the Old Testament, they did repeatedly fall back into transgression. They repeatedly kill, uh, resisted warnings. They repeatedly killed prophets. And so if you look at God's punishment, not on individual persons, but as, as the nation or as the people, when Jesus came, many Jews excuse me, rejected him. They were hard-hearted. They couldn't receive him. And so since then, the apostles went to reach many Gentiles. And a lot of evangelists would tell you that today Jews are some of the hardest people to reach with the gospel. Okay, so even if you wanted to say, well, you know, Jews need to turn from transgression. Well, in a way, they didn't turn from transgression. And now they can't even follow the basics of believe the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jews today, they're in uh, complete blindness with false gospel and false religion. And so that's the effect that not turning from transgression has had on the Jewish people. It has nothing to do with how an individual gets saved. So not turning from transgression has resulted in them not even turning from unbelief. And so it's not because they, it's not that they can't be saved because they have too much sin in their life. It's because of the transgression of Israel and unbelief that the kingdom was taken from them and given to the nation bearing the fruits thereof and so now you know they are, as a people they are in in spiritual darkness okay now the next point then to address is this come to me because that that's what he's equating with 
salvation. So the Saviour comes to them, they turn from their transgression. Obviously, he's misquoting Redeemer as Saviour. But if they don't turn from their transgression, the Saviour or the Redeemer won't come to them, and so they they can't be saved. Okay, that that's his argument. He's equating comes to them as giving eternal life, as if that's what that means. Well, I'm going to show you that that's not what that means at all. Okay, so have a look at these next verses. So if we look at John 6, verses 35 to 37, he that believe on me, okay, uh, and, uh, you know, this is in the context of everlasting life, that's what he's talking about in this chapter. Jesus said, he that comes to me, okay, and again, him that cometh to me. He didn't say, I will go on to them, he comes to me. That's how he phrased it. Further in the same chapter, 44 to 45, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me to draw him. Now, the Father does need to draw them, yes. But who's coming to who? They are coming to Jesus. Jesus isn't coming to them. He is coming to Jesus. Okay, and again, cometh unto me. Who is coming to who? Is Jesus going to he, him, or is he going to Jesus? He is going to Jesus. That's how this is working here. Okay, here's another one, John 3 talking about everlasting life and believing on him. That's the context here. It's an eternal life passage. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, but then he that does truth comes to the light. So so who is coming to? Is the light coming to him? Or is he coming to the light? Or, or should the light be coming to him? Or should he be coming to the light? He should be coming to the light, not the light coming to him. Okay, you see, this stuff matters, folks. John 5 you will not come unto me that you might have life, eternal life. So again, eternal life is the subject. Who comes to who? You are supposed to come to Jesus. It's not Jesus coming to you. That's what it says, okay? You can, you know, stand on your Calvinist pulpit about, oh, the Father draws. Yes, the Father does draw, but it still says, he that cometh to me. That's what it says. John 7, if any man thirst, let him come unto me. He that believeth on me. So we're still talking about believing on him for eternal life. And it's he comes to me. Who is coming to who? He is coming to Jesus. Jesus is not coming to him. Okay. And so we quite clearly see then that the transaction that takes place when somebody believes onto eternal life is that he comes to Jesus, not Jesus coming to him as this verse supposes. So notwithstanding all the time that we've just spent going through Isaiah in its proper context, that that right there alone, just that two minutes of looking through those John verses proves right there that this is not an eternal life passage verse because the transaction that's taking place here is in the wrong direction okay this says Jesus comes to them but we quite clearly saw from those John verses that are talking about believing and are talking about eternal life that he comes to Jesus not Jesus coming to him this is the complete wrong way around for the eternal life transaction. So this is not an eternal life verse, but but he's making that incorrect association there. Okay. And then the last point, I won't make a big thing of this because you might say that this is word games, but, but he said their transgressions, plural. Well, there's no there. Okay. There's, there's no, uh, you know, adjective for the, the people there. And there's, it's not transgressions, plural. It's transgression, singular. Now, People might say I'm playing word games, but if, it, if it's transgression singular, it's not necessarily, well, put down the drink, and put down the pornography, and put, put down this, and put down that. It's the transgression or encompassing the stuff that Isaiah was talking about specifically. Okay, very specific things. I won't go too much into that because, you know, you might disagree with me. Fine, but, you know, we, we've given more than enough evidence that this is not a salvation verse. It's directed to God's people, and the transaction here is the wrong way around. And that's why it doesn't even say save it. It says redeemer in that verse. Okay. So, you know, in summary, Isaiah 59, 20 doesn't use the word repent in most translations. So it can't really define repentance for salvation. It's addressed to God's people. It's not addressed to tell unsaved people how to be saved. It's never quoted in the New Testament to preach the gospel. Redeeming is what is recovering what already belongs to God in the first place anyway. It says the Redeemer shall come to them, but we saw that eternal life is coming to Jesus, so it's not equatable. And, and even if you disagree with everything else I said, I mean, that right there is inescapable. I don't know how you can talk your way around that. The next chapter has a lot of end times themes, so it's not even evident that the surrounding context then in Isaiah 59, 20 is even referring to his first coming. It might actually be referring to his second coming when he shall appear a second time to look for them without sin unto salvation, quoting uh, the Hebrews' way of saying things there. 
And Isaiah contains a lot of poetic statements. So should we really go with something that's poetic, that's not even evidently talking about how to gain eternal life at the expense of all these clear statements from Jesus about the subject in John's Gospel and so on? Or should we just go with the clear statements and then let's sit around a round table and try and actually, you know, re re-understand Isaiah 59? I mean, you know, goes without saying, doesn't it, folks? And so, no, seeking the one saved, this doesn't contradict my documentary as far as I'm concerned. It's perfectly consistent with everything I said in the documentary. Now, did I overlook the fact that the NIV does say repent of their sins in that verse? Yes, I overlooked it for the reasons that I explained, and I'm sorry I missed it. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's not a salvation verse, and you even quoted it wrong when you were quoting it as well. That is not eternal life compatible, that that bit there. Okay, it's the wrong way around. So it's perfectly consistent with everything that I said in the documentary. That is addressed to God's own people. And so that's, I hope that this video, I'm sorry it's not very professionally done and I've, I've kind of uh, stuttered a little bit, but I hope that that's clarified my answer to Isaiah 59, 20, uh, you know, in case anybody's going to look at his comment on the documentary and they're going to be wondering about that. And perhaps they think that I didn't give a, a substantial answer. Okay.